We uh, have here a world-renowned expert on crisis leadership and leading in extreme situations. So this will be relevant to many of the, uh, many of the topics that we have been studying in the class uh, so far. Tom has many roles. He's a social psychologist. He is a soldier. He is a scholar and a skydiver. Did I miss any S's? No, I think we got, got it. All the S's. I think we got it. Yeah. <laughs> to give you a bit of his background, um, Tom is a retired brigadier general and a professor emeritus from the Military Academy at West Point, where he led the Department of Behavioral Sciences there for 12 years. Um, as part of his career, he spent two years at the Pentagon as an advisor and also was the founding director of the West Point Leadership Center. Tom retired recently from West Point and is now at the Yale School of Management, who we're lucky to have him, where he's designing and implementing a school-wide leadership program for the MBAs there. I personally first met Tom uh, several years ago when we were both at a Yale CEO conference in New York. Um, we kind of hit it off, and at that point, I was actually new to the sport of skydiving. So Tom learned this, and after a couple of days, I got a great gift from him. I got a handwritten note that was the top 10 things that a new skydiver should know, <laughs> which I still have. Really? I do, and I refer to it. <laughs> Included on that note were things like, the first person who wants to come and give you advice at the drop zone is the last person you should be listening to, right? And it's better to be on the ground wishing that you were in the sky than in the sky wishing you were on the ground. <laughs> so words literally to live by. I came to realize that this was very typical, very characteristic of Tom, who is both wise, um, extremely intelligent, talented, and also very compassionate, very committed to helping people develop themselves as professionals and as people. So please welcome Tom Colditz. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's great. Can you all hear me all right? Terrific. Okay. Um, well, today we're going to talk a little bit about leadership in dangerous contexts and what we can learn from that. Um, <clears throat> when I started down this road, I thought that what I was doing was building an understanding for people like soldiers and firefighters and police officers. But as I, as I got the data and started Looking at what I was learning about leadership, I realized it was a lot broader. So I think you're going to find this is applicable to you in, in many ways. And one way that I'd like to underscore is that <clears throat> I take a very psychological approach. I it's my training. So I take a very psychological approach to leadership as interpersonal influence. And what that means is what we're going to talk about today, the principles involved, are as applicable in your private lives as they are in your professional or, or public lives. You can't, you, you carry the same brain with you to work that you have when you're at home and, and so forth. So all of this is going to apply in, in both, those, uh, both those kinds of settings. Um, <clears throat> and I'll try to go through this quickly so that we can get to a point where we have some Q&A or some discussion at the end. Um, one of the things I like to do when I'm talking to people is just ask them a little bit about themselves. So I just want to go through this list with you real quick. How many of you have been shot at before? Okay, a couple. How about extreme sport people? Half pipers, helicopter skiers, scuba divers, skydivers. Okay, uh, military police or firefighting experience. Okay, life-threatening crisis. You've been in a crisis. Okay, good. Death in your organization. More people. How many of you have been in a government or organization that was in crisis? Okay, great. And now the hardest one, responsible or accountable for the death of another person. Okay. So... Somebody in the room raised their hand to pretty much all of this stuff. And th this is really what defines crisis kinds of circumstances for us. And the reason this was important to me is that when I was at West Point, the people that we graduated from there would say yes to every one of these things within 18 months of graduating. So this became my developmental target for them. This was kind of the, the leadership that I had to figure out and do. Because when I first got there, I got there in the year 2000, I'd left the tactical army. I'd been commanding troops and doing stuff that colonels and generals do. And then I left the tactical army because, heck, why not? There wasn't a war going on or anything. Um, and, and wound up uh, being at West Point when war broke out. And so I looked around our leadership curriculum, which was very academic and rigorous and evidence-based. 
and had nothing to do with leading in these kinds of contexts. It just, we just didn't have any information on it. And when I went to the faculty there and I said, hey, what gives? You know, you're, you're, you're educating army officers. Why don't we know about this stuff? And they're like, well, the research doesn't exist and we only use evidence-based principles in our, in our instruction here. And I said, all right, buddy. Well, we're going to go get some evidence. Uh, and so I started doing research to figure out what leadership is like under these kinds of circumstances. Um, why do we talk about this kind of thing, Eden? Well, for anybody, <clears throat> leadership in dangerous places hinges primarily on trust. One of the reasons that, that circumstances become dangerous is because you don't have the information you need. You don't know what's going to happen next. There's uncertainty and volatility. And so you have to trust one another. I mean, you have to trust people in those kinds of uncertain circumstances. But at the same time, whether it's a relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend or a job that you have somewhere else, trust is still the coin of the realm, right? Trust is still really important to you uh, in terms of your relationships with other people. Um, I've always argued that there's a moral imperative uh, to leadership. <clears throat> and the more you're responsible for, the more it, it becomes obvious to you because people wind up depending on you to run your company or your business or whatever it is that you do uh, so that they can put food on their table, you know, so that they can send their kid to college, so that they can, you know, have a roof over their heads. And when you, when you step up and you say, I want to be a leader, I want to run a company, I want to be a leader in government, I want to be a leader in industry, well, now you have other people's outcomes in your hands. And that means you have a moral imperative. And in crisis in particular, when things are going really badly, that's the point at which you have an obligation to shine. And I always told the cadets graduating from West Point, when it came to crisis leadership and understanding how to, how to, how to lead in crisis, they didn't have the right to be bad at it. They didn't have the right to take 30 or 40 of other people's kids into a place like Iraq or Afghanistan and be bad at it. And, and it's the same when you go into an elite business and you start moving people's money around or you start valuing stock in your, in your company and you've got all these shareholders out there that are, that are depending on you. So it's not just about you, it's about your obligation to others. Uh, we can learn a lot about leadership by studying it in dangerous places and here's why. Most of, most of the time when we see leaders, they are both leading and managing. Management being much more about policy and procedures and, and, and those sorts of things. And then leadership is more the interpersonal influence part. Well, in a dangerous context, when people are afraid for their lives, they do not care what the policies are. They do not care where you are in the wiring diagram. They, they do not care what the, you know, the written requirements are because they tend to be so concerned for their physical well-being that all, any punishment from any of that other stuff pales in comparison. So it's all about your ability to influence them. That's pure leadership, okay? It's not management at, at that point anymore. And then lastly, people underestimate their proximity to the next crisis. Everybody's raising their hand about all these things, you know, when I asked them, you know, if they'd experienced that. And the reality is that when it comes to things like a devastating medical diagnosis in your family or a car accident, or you know, some other kind of major problem in your organization, a meltdown on your athletic team, you, know, you don't get to pick and choose when that happens. And because most of you are mentally healthy, you don't think it's gonna be tonight or tomorrow. But for somebody, it always is, you know? It always is, and we forget that. So now is the time to be thinking through, what can I learn about this? You know, how can I get better uh, at this? Because once the crisis happens, it's too late. It's too late. You, you dance with what brung you, you know. Um, so what I like to do next is to show a video that kind of kicks off this notion of crisis and how people behave during crisis. And um, this is a very interesting video. It's about six minutes long. Um, thanks to thanks to uh, to our our incredible tech staff here. We've got we've got it going. Um, and. <clears throat> There's three people that are the principal actors in this that I want you to pay attention to and listen to what they say about crisis. The first person is a, is a uh, young soldier named Channing Moss, and he had the unfortunate experience of being wounded in Afghanistan. And so he's going to talk about that and what it meant to him. That's his crisis. 
And then you're going to hear from a surgeon who's a West Point graduate named John O. And he's going to talk about how he handled crisis and what his decisions were like. And then the third person you're going to hear from is a, uh, an explosives ordnance disposal sergeant, a hurt locker guy. And he's going to talk about operating in crisis and, and how he does it. And they all three have very differing perspectives. And I want you to, to listen carefully for those three perspectives. I will tell you this vi video is somewhat graphic. There's some photographs of wounds and there's some blood and there's some operating room scenes. So if that kind of thing makes you, you know, queamy or, you know, it bothers you, then uh, I would suggest you toughen up a little bit because um, <laughs> we're going to watch it anyway. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but, but listen, and then afterwards we're going to talk about it. So hopefully I'll run here. I think you have to click the... Click here? Yeah, on the bottom there, if you scroll down to the bottom, there should be a... I think you might have to do... Oh, yeah, I see. Perfect. March 16, 2006, we were on a mounted patrol in Afghanistan, and we were coming around a, bull, a bend, and we were ambushed from the left. They began to shoot small arms fire, and then heavy arms fire with RPGs. One RPG went over the head of our truck, and I was struck with the RPG that went into my abdomen. It came through the top of my Humvee. And it pierced my pierced my pelvic bone, my pelvic wing. It came through and got enlarged in my right thigh. And it got stuck there. I was like, I just kept asking them to chop a couple of because I thought I'd never get back to my family. I just I thought I was just gonna die right there. I felt the cool breeze of the chopper just coming in. And I could see that yellow smoke. I just thought about I thought about my wife and my girls growing up without me. And some of those, those quiet moments I had, and like when I had my eyes closed on the plane, I just thought I was gonna die. I just thought they weren't gonna be able to save me. And I was never gonna be able to. You know, if I did survive, I wasn't gonna be able to function. Yeah, I was. I, I felt. I felt that peace in one moment. That if I did die, that I did. I died for the right cause and I did the right thing. But you, you want to fight and you want to live and, and your inner feeling is to fight. You know, you can go on, you can do this. We touched down at OE and we, I can remember them just rushing, rushing like to get me out, just rushing, rushing. And they sat me on the table and they started cutting all my clothes off. And I can remember just Captain O looking at me like, he's got a lot of ordinance in him, everybody get out. After they had removed all his clothing, I could clearly see this rod sticking out of his hip, so I was actually looking at it, and I had never seen an RPG before, but this was this looked like some kind of munition because it had fins on it. So it's kind of hard to imagine any other piece of, any other rod that would have fins on it sticking out of somebody's hip. The guideline is you're not supposed to bring them in the aid station. You actually leave them outside, and you treat them as what we call an expectant patient. So you treat them like he's going to blow up, So which means that you put them outside the aid station. Um, you take precautions to keep them away from the facility, um, but essentially you treat them like an expectant patient, like he's not gonna survive. You know, I was scared, I was scared shitless. <laughs> I'd never been so scared in my whole life. And you look at the guy and then you think, there's no way I'm gonna let this guy die. It, it just can't happen, it can't happen. <coughs> UD came and we were trying to figure out what this bomb was, and UD was saying that it could go off at any second. This thought went through my head that these were the last people I was ever going to see, potentially. I said, if this thing goes off, I just want you all to know it's been great working with you. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. You all have an RPG inside, a possible RPG inside a soldier. Worst case scenario, we could bring the roof down on top of us, and you, but you would already be dead before the roof hit the ground. We took an x-ray of them to see what we had inside him, and we found out that we had was just from this portion of, this is an RPG here, just from this portion back in the tail fins, which is another additional foot to six inches, was impaled inside him from his, above his left hip into his right thigh. Now we worried about the fact that there was a detonator and which still had an explosive charge to it, but not as great, that could uh, wound 
the surgeons uh, kill the patient and uh, wound ourselves while we're working. It was imperative to get this thing out as quick as possible in order to um, do fit, complete the operation and save his life. At that point, I don't think anybody thought about the danger to themselves. We just thought about getting this thing out as fast as possible. It was a feeling of tension, of course, but of amazement at the same time that we were able to be involved in doing something like this and removing an RPG from a person that was still alive. Our whole thought the entire time was how to keep Cheney Moss alive. The moment until I had that RPG out of outside of Cheney Moss, it was complete silence. I was inside myself. I was knowing what I was doing and it had no distractions until the moment that that RPG was out of my hands. Then that's when the world came back into play and it was like just a vacuum was released and all the noise, all the commotion. And I, I just sat down and I started shaking. Uh, it was... Complete release. Just complete amazement release at the same time and oh my god, we just we just finished something that saved a kid's life. I think I did it because I knew that he had a chance to make it. But the basic reason was because Channing Moss was looking at me and talking and breathing and that's why I did. For me to do it once, you know, <clears throat> when he shows up, I don't think that's a very heroic thing. For these guys to go outside the wire and put themselves at risk and lives at risk every day, that's heroic. From my chain of command to the people that I was with on the ground when I got hurt, to the pilot that actually took the initiative to fly me out, and when I got the OE to the four surgical team, and all those people that were volunteers and, vol and volunteered to do what they had to do and they could have could have died at any time. They could have blew up and they could be missing arms, legs right now. Because I still had a lot of awareness in me. They, they took the initiative. It speaks with Thank God for them people being in the position that they were in at the time. Thank them. I mean, they all want my life. I want my life. Okay, so not that many first-hand views of life-threatening crisis, but that was one. You know, that was six minutes of it that you get to see. And so part of my job is to produce more of that. That was what I was doing at the time at West Point. I was figuring out how, to, how this works. How, how does something like that happen? And um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit um, about what you heard. So Channing Moss, you know, wham, you know, with absolutely no warning, his life is in total threat and, and disarray. And what is on his mind? What's his perspective as a rank and file guy? Family. Family. Very fundamental concerns. Is, am I going to be okay? Is my family going to be okay? Will we be able to, you know, to continue? Very fundamental concerns. What far too many leaders forget is that rank and file people in organizations, when things start going bad, they're not thinking so much about the organization necessarily. They may be at work, they may be there, but what's going on in their head is something much deeper and more fundamental. How does this affect me? Now, let's talk about the leader. Let's talk about John O. What did he say that was kind of interesting or stood out to you that was maybe a little different than, than what, what, the, uh, what Channing Moss was saying? Anybody hear him say anything interesting that you didn't expect to hear? Yeah. I thought it was interesting when he said that he didn't feel he was heroic in that sense. Right. You know, he is manifesting the values that he was brought up to demonstrate. He's there to save lives. You know, that's, that's what he does. So he's very humble, very unselfish. And his unselfishness is really what allowed him to succeed. He had every opportunity to follow managerial policy. What was managerial policy? Keep him outside the aid station. Army doctrine. 
Okay? Keep him outside the aid station. So he had every right to do that and to, and to let that kid die. But he didn't. Because <clears throat> one of the things that happens in crisis that you need to be ready for and you need to think about is that managerial practices and rules don't necessarily apply anymore. People feel, feel very empowered to step outside of the, of the rules. And so you have to understand the people working for you are going to do that. And you have to understand that for you, one of the most important decisions you're going to make in a crisis is which rules you aren't going to follow anymore. Because it's not about trying to keep the rule book intact. It's about trying to save lives or to resolve the crisis or, or to be safer or, or whatever. And, and then you sort out the rules later. It was the same in Katrina. You know, when people tried to follow rules about dis distributing water and getting approvals and communicating when they didn't have the ability to communicate, the whole thing fell apart. And it wasn't until, you know, Russ Honore, this, this Henri three-star general, Cajun guy from Louisiana comes in and says, you know, we'll sort out everything else later. You know, put the people on the plane. The pilot said, where's the manifest? We don't have a manifest. Put the people on the plane. We can't print one out. We don't have electricity. We don't have a computer. We don't have anything. Get them on the plane. So really important perspective to have. Now, Danny Brown, the explosives ordnance sergeant who carried that thing outside the aid station and put it behind the sandbags, how did he get through this thing? He was just ultra-focused. Ultra-focused. That's exactly right. Focus totally on the task. Total task focus. And then when he, when he said he put the weapon behind, you know, out of the aid station and he sat down, that's when he started shaking, right? That's when he lost his focus and he went back in and he was emotional. Okay? And, and, and so that's when he got emotional relating it. When he talked about doing it, he was fine. When he talked about having done it, that's when he got emotional. Same with the physician. When the physician talked about doing it, he was fine. When he talked about having done it, in the past tense, he became emotional. I'm going to show you why that is and how you control that in your own lives and how you make that work. So, <clears throat> so really, we've got these three really important perspectives. The follower perspective, which is a basic fundamental concern for family. The technician, which is this outward focus, high performance, low emotionality. And then we have this more complicated leader perspective that has to begin to balance other people's interests. He was laying there and breathing, and I was not going to let him die. Who had a doctor who had to compose a totally volunteer surgical team because he couldn't order anybody to go in there with him. He had to ask for volunteers to go in there with him. Okay? Um, the, the primary difference between a technician and a, and a leader is this notion of other people being in the room. And the thing that you need to remember about all three of these is that it's not like you're just one. Just because you're in charge of something doesn't mean that there won't be times, you know, kind of like deep in the bowels of the night when you sit down and you think, what does this mean for my family? What does this mean for me personally? And there will also be times when you're not too concerned about people, you're a technician, you're outwardly focused, low emotionality. But there have to be times when you reach out to other people. So you cycle in and out of these three perspectives for as long as you're in a crisis. And remember, some crises last six to nine months, depending on what kind of industry you're in, what kind of problem it is. BP oil spill, how, do, how long do you think that was a crisis for some people? Okay, so it can be a slow burn. Um, this is not... What I talk about is not a metaphor. What I'm talking about is a specific psychology. It's about what do people need in crisis. And so I'm going to talk to you now about four research studies that we did to gather data on this. Because we didn't want to change our tradition in the department at West Point that we only, you know, that we only study and, and teach evidence-based things. It's just we didn't have any evidence. So this is the first place I went. This is a place called Hilla in Iraq. And I took a six-week trip to Iraq with three other people, and we literally hitchhiked around the battlefield, getting on and off helicopters that didn't belong to us. We had no food. We had to borrow food from people, which we never returned, obviously. Um, you know, but for six weeks, we moved around the battlefield doing interviews of soldiers and asking them what their, what their leaders were like. We did hour and 15-minute interviews of both U.S. soldiers, U.S. Marines, and 36 Iraqi prisoners 
that I was able to talk to through um, an, a military intelligence uh, interrogator. Um, this is a really cool place. Those are the ruins of ancient Babylon at the base of this palace at Hilla. And this is the, these are all marine vehicles. I interviewed 16 marines in that palace uh, over a two day period. So we, we flew that back and then we content analyzed all these interviews. The second study we did was a trust study in a place called Mosul. One of the, one of the PhDs in my department, our doctoral student actually, uh, left to go fight. He left graduate school to go to Iraq and while he was over there, he was able to gather data on trust and it wound up being his whole doctoral dissertation and multiple publications after he got back. The third study I did was a study that was a comparison between the NCAA team sport captains at West Point, 20 of them in individual and team sports, and the 10 most experienced cadets on the West Point parachute team. West Point has a competitive collegiate parachute team. When the weather's nice, they jump five days a week, uh, sometimes six uh, out of helicopters, and I coached that team for 12 years. Skydiving is just something that I've done pretty much my whole life, and so that was part of my job there was to, to be their advisor and one of their instructors. And then the last study I did was more of a classic interview study where I br brought in a bunch of these leaders that I thought typified this notion of in extremis leadership. So these were people like climbing guides from the Exum School at Jackson Hole, Wyoming that took people up Everest and K2 and, and these dangerous climbs. Uh, I brought in a woman who did HD video of tigers on the ground in Indian tiger preserves. Uh, brought in the SWAT team chiefs from the San Francisco and New York offices of the FBI. Brought in uh, one of the deputy chiefs of uh, firefighting in New York City. Brought in a, uh, let's see, large formation skydiving organizers that put 300 or 400 people together in free fall out of eight or 10 separate airplanes flying in formation. Big deal, hard to do, lots of people get killed doing it. So the only thing that these people all had in common with one another was that they routinely led in dangerous places and that they had somebody get killed on their watch. And to me that was enough that I could be sure that they were highly experienced at leading in dangerous contexts. That's, that's what I wanted for this 24 person sample. So four studies, lots of data, lots of charts and graphs and everything. And so we pull it all together and we built a descriptive framework for leadership in dangerous or crisis contexts. And by descriptive, what I mean by that is I was not trying to build a theory about why this happens and I was not trying to promote any ideas I might have. I just wanted to say how it is. I just wanted it to describe what I found uh, in the real world, because I'm a simple guy. Um, <clears throat> so this is the framework, and I, and I will walk you through uh, each part of it. And the first thing we found was something called inherent motivation. When we asked those team captains to, to work with us, one of the things I asked them to do was to take nine leadership competencies, competencies being things like communicating, decision-making, motivating, building the organization, learning, and, and rank order those nine competencies according to what their personal strengths were. Okay. So for the team sport captains and the individual sport captains of the NCAA sports, the number one competency far and away was motivating, which kind of makes sense. You know, if, you, if you've got an athletic team, you want them highly motivated to be able to, to do, their, do their thing. But when we looked at the data from the parachute team instructors, motivating was second from the bottom of a list of nine. It was not even on their radar screen. And so when we dug into that, we, we found something really pretty interesting, and that is that in crisis contexts, people are already pretty spun up before you even get started as a leader. And so these kind of high motivator sales type leaders don't do well in dangerous contexts. The kind of leaders that do well are really quiet people, very professional. They tend to calm people down instead of spinning people up. And what it really means for people not in dangerous places is that you have to match your influence of people with their level of, of motivation. They've already got some level. Might be low, might be high. You know, in sports, if you've got a team with very low motivation, well, that's a time to bring the heat. 
You know, that's the time to spin them up. But if you've already got a group of people, you know, in your firehouse or on your SWAT team that are already motivated and, and pumped up, then the last thing they need is somebody screaming and yelling at them. That's the last thing that they need. And Hollywood, unfortunately, does us no favors. Because if you're a Hollywood director, what do you want to do? You want to excite everyone in the movie theater. You, know, you want people to be upset and, and, and wound up about what they're seeing. So leaders are always much more animated than they really should be. They're far too often emotional and yelling and everything else. If you're a leader in crisis, you don't have the right to be emotional all over people. You know, get in touch with yourself some other time. You know, but you know, your job is to keep everybody calm and to, and to back them down, not spin them up. So if, if motivating was not at the top of this parachute team's list, what was? Well, it was learning. And these are highly experienced people, more than 500 jumps, competed nationally, teaching other people every day, five or six days a week. Okay, and so we dug into that and we found some really interesting things. First thing we found is that they were very good at the same kind of outward focus that you heard Danny Brown talk about. You know, if, you're, if, if you have to get out of a helicopter and stand on the skid two miles above the ground and check somebody else's gear and pay attention to your own gear and make sure there are no planes gonna run into you, I mean, that requires outward focus. If, if, if you start looking down and thinking how you feel about that, then, then you're gonna be in trouble, you're gonna get scared. It's scary, you know? But if you are outwardly focused, if you're focused on your job, doing your job, then, then you're in, in uh, very good shape. And the reason that happens is that fear and anger and those kinds of emotional responses are seated in the amygdala, in that center brain structure that you have. That's where you get the, the famous fight or flight reflex that you heard about in introductory psychology when you took that. Um, so, but, but when you are task focused, you're actually in your prefrontal cortex. It's a different part of your brain that gets activated by that focus on task. And it's very hard for you to have two parts of your brain spun up at the same time. So <clears throat> when Danny Brown was talking about being totally focused on, on his job, he was right here. And then when he sat the weapon back behind the sandbags, then he slipped back here and that's when he starts shaking and crying and doing all that other kind of stuff, okay? So what, what we would do at West Point and what I would do on my parachute team, I would never tell anybody get control of your emotions or, or, or control your emotions because that turns people inward and it just makes things worse. But if you tell someone you are not focused enough, you are, you are not focused enough on the task for you to operate without becoming frightened or without becoming angry or without becoming whatever the negative emotion is. And it's important for all of you to understand that when you have to do things when you are uncomfortable, that if you can focus on intently on the task, you'll be fine. You'll be, you'll be amazed at what you can do. But as soon as you stop, as soon as you just stop, that's when you're going to turn inward and that's when it's going to become very difficult for you. And this, by the way, is learned behavior. Anybody can get really good at this. And whether you're a surgeon someday and you're focused in an, in an operating room and you have to be totally focused and you know that if you screw this up that this person is not going home, you know, that requires that kind of outward focus. Because if you, if you think about what you're doing, if you think about the consequences of it, you're going to be scared. You're going to be dysfunctionally influenced by your emotions. And I, I like to use these things right up here. These are two EEG traces of an individual who's a pistol shooter. And the one on the left is a pistol shooter shooting at a target, practicing. The one on the right is the same pistol shooter, same target, same pistol, but competing. And just the difference in focus between competition and uh, practice is evident on an EEG trace. I mean, you can see the difference in focus. So when I talk about shifting back and forth between these two brain structures, it's not an itty bitty pity pack kind of thing. It's a major shift in how your brain's functioning and it's powerful. It's powerful enough that the people in this room, when you practice on it, 
I mean, you can do things that you never believed was possible for you under high conditions of threat, and, uh, and you'll be just fine. Um, the next thing we found, oh, oh, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about this notion of learning. Because when you are focused outside yourself on the environment, it puts you in a posture where you can learn very rapidly. If you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, an organism that's under threat, that focuses on the environment that's trying to kill it, and then learns very rapidly, that's the organi or organism that's going to live for 50,000 years. You know, that's adaptive. And so... I had this driven home to me. I mean, I'm a kind of a data-driven guy, but this was an anecdote that I want to share with you. And it has to do with this fellow right here. His name's Matt. And Matt's mom came to me, and this is this about three and a half years old now. Uh, his mom came to me and said, you know, you're coaching the West Point team. I'd, I'd really like you to take my son on a tandem jump. And I said, well, why don't you just take him to the commercial skydiving center? Everybody does this. You know, you can, you can do it anytime you want. She said, well, Matt has autism. And... Matt has Asperger's, and Matt has some physical reduction. If you look real carefully, you see how much smaller his left arm is than his right arm and how his left leg looks a little smaller than his right leg. And that's a problem for, for many uh, parachute instructors because if you're asymmetrical at high speed, you spin. And spins are really, really dangerous. I mean, a, a hard, uncontrolled spin with two people like that um, there have been instances where the instructor has been able to survive it, but it, it spun them so hard that it flattened the arches in their feet uh, and burst blood vessels in their eyes. So you can, you can literally spin until you stroke out. So, so I said, sure, I'll take them. Why not? Um, <laughs> but, but seriously, I mean, I, I didn't think that his asymmetry was uh, as much of a problem. I, I just didn't think it was, I mean, nobody is perfectly symmetrical. And... So, but I, but I did, he was bigger than me. He was like 6'4 and 215, and, uh, and I, I wanted him under control. So I brought him in, and, and I, before he got there, I kind of studied his circumstances. What does it take for him to learn? And, you know, the answer kept coming back. He has to be able to focus. He has to be able to stay with you and not walk away. And so <clears throat> I, uh, I brought him in and I said, Matt, you know, we're going to go on a parachute jump today and it's not an amusement park ride. It's a real parachute jump. And uh, if you don't listen to what I say and you, and you do the wrong thing, then you're going to die a horrible death here right in front of your mom. And uh, she didn't like that. Um, but nobody ever talked to him. And you know what? He took it in absolute, in absolutely in stride. He's like, okay, I understand. And he never left my side for two and a half hours. And when he jumped, I mean, he did... He did fine. You see, I've got one arm back here and one arm up here because it's, he's trying to turn us and I'm trying to turn us in the other way. So to keep us straight, we had to be in this kind of like turning mode. But, um, but he did fine and he got up. He wanted to go again. He, he has since scuba dived. He has a job. And <clears throat> there was a lot of emphasis on this in, in the psychology arena for helping to teach people with autism through sport and through focus challenges, you know, to, whether not necessarily dangerous sports, but sports that require them to focus intently in order to perform. Um, so it was a good lesson for me. Um, the next thing we found was something called shared risk, which is this kind of lead from the front, you know. I mean, everybody kind of gets the idea that the leader has to be out front. Um, but, but there's this notion of the leader being visibly out front that's really important. And during, you know, you see Mayor Bloomberg up there, leading from the front during Hurricane Sandy. His hair's getting blown around and everything. I wish he'd have worn something a little more Abercrombie than this black thing here, but he, uh, he was out there, he was visible, and, uh, and, and doing well. This guy right here, James Molinaro, the, uh, the super tough um, Staten Island borough president, was not pleased, however, because what he did not see was leadership from the American Red Cross. And I'm not going to play it now, but there's a video of him kind of going off on the Red Cross. And he said, all these people making these big salaries should be out there on the front line. And I'm disappointed. And my advice to the people of Staten Island is, do not donate to the American Red Cross. Let them get their money elsewhere. Estimates are that that cost the Red, on national TV, replayed, that cost the Red Cross between 5 and $10 million in donations during Sandy. And... The, it's really actually hard to find online right now because once the 
network started realizing that it was doing all this damage to the Red Cross, then they, they kind of shut it all down. You know, they didn't talk about it anymore. But, uh, but the Red Cross people, in all fairness, could have been working 24-7 for this guy. But they weren't visible. They were not visible. And that makes a big difference. The next thing we found was something that's a little bit similar, called a common lifestyle. And it has to do with lowering your social distance when you're leading in a crisis. Now, you know, in normal circumstances, leaders sometimes take, uh, they kind of take liberties. That, you know, maybe they've got a better car. Maybe they sleep in a little better accommodations. Maybe, uh, you know, they, their hours aren't the same as everybody else's. Maybe they don't socialize or meet people on a given level who work for them. You know, they establish a little social distance there. Well, when things go badly, what people need is for leaders to reduce their social distance.